Hello, and thanks for joining in. I'm Jana Harmon, and you're listening to the Side B Podcast, where we listen to the other side. Each podcast, we listen to someone who's been an atheist and has also been a Christian. Through listening to their story, we listen to both perspectives from someone who has thought and lived on the other side. There's something inside of us that we all seem to know that is undeniable, and more than that, unavoidable. There's that something that reminds us that our thoughts and our actions are sometimes good and sometimes not so good. If we take God off the table to find our moral freedom to determine what is good for ourselves, that comes with a cost. With atheism, there is no real good or bad, no real right or wrong. Those are merely feelings we socially construct to survive in life. The moral choice, then, becomes an oxymoron. There is no real choice. There is no real chooser. According to Richard Dawkins, we are just DNA dancing to its music. Nothing done or said is inherently bad, so there is no moral culpability. If we can't even control our own thoughts or actions, and they're determined for us, there is no moral responsibility. But it begs the question, why are we constantly judging ourselves and others? if good and bad are not real moral issues, but rather it just is the way that it is? Why do we complain about something we think is bad in the world, in others, and in ourselves, if things just are the way they are? If we accept a godless reality, we also deny the reality of our own dignity, our free choices, the things that make us human. We give up any real standards of good or evil. That was the dilemma confronting today's podcast guest. A very intelligent, thoughtful atheist, Jordan Manji, also held to a strong moral understanding of herself and the world. The problem was, she didn't have a way to make sense of her own moral judgments within her own atheistic worldview. How did she resolve this problem? I hope you'll come along with me to see. Welcome to the Side B Podcast, Jordan. It's great to have you today. Thanks for hosting me. I'm excited to be chatting with you. As we're getting started, so the listener can have a sense of of who you are, Jordan, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and maybe where you Uh, where you live, a little bit about your family. Yeah. So uh, I'm originally from Irvine, California, and I uh, graduated and went to Harvard University where I studied philosophy. And after that, um, I worked for a couple of years and then I pursued my master's in theology at Fuller Theological Seminary, uh, which I completed a couple of years ago. And uh, I finished it right before I became a mom. So I'm I'm married now and I have a a two-year-old daughter and I have a little uh, three-week-old here with me right now. So if you hear any noises in the background, um, you you might hear uh, him chime in just a little bit. And um, my husband and I, now we live in Northern California. So that's where we're currently based. And Uh I split my time um, between uh, taking care of our two two small children, and uh, I do some tutoring on the side as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you that that you're here with us and that your your new little baby is too. Wow. Just appreciate you taking time out as a new mom. I know that's not easy. So um, So it's a nice mental break. (laughs) Ah, yes, yes. Um, Yes. As a mom, Although I'm I'm long past that season, I'm now an empty nester. Which I'm in a very different season. So, but I appreciate those uh, those days a long time ago, and welcome those little noises if they do occur. So let's get started with your story. You said you were you're from Irvine, California. Why don't you take us back to when you were a little girl and 
and the context in which you grew up, perhaps your family uh, and your community. Yeah. We, where, where did you grow up and was there any sense of God or religion or faith in, in your world? So um, my, my grandparents, you know, were, were Christian and, and Catholic. Um, but my parents themselves didn't hold any faith. So, um, my mom, um, just didn't, didn't believe in God or in the Bible. Uh, but she's not quite as, you know, adamant about it. My dad is actually a a philosophy professor. He teaches, um, at a couple of the community colleges in Orange County, California, and, um, he has a very strong sense of, of what he believes and why. And, uh, his, his joke is that, uh, his parents sent him to 14 years of Catholic school and it was so good that, uh, he realized it was all false. Oh my. <laughs> that the education okay. was so good. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, <laughs> um, but he, he, from a young age had questioned what they were teaching him in, in his Catholic school. And so, um, when I was growing up, I, my dad was actually, um, getting his, uh, master's in philosophy from UC Irvine. And so I would go with him to classes and I would sit in the back of the classes that he was teaching. And I continued to do that uh, through elementary school. And so uh, I was just familiar with a lot of the arguments for and against God. And my parents felt very firmly that they they didn't want to raise me to be an atheist. They wanted to raise me to question things and to come to my own beliefs and perspective. Um, but what's sort of interesting about that is, you know, from from a young age, you you pick up things differently being raised in, in an environment where your parents don't believe. So um, one of the stories that uh, my parents told me about happened when I was just four years old, actually. And um, we were at a party and my mom came out to hear me arguing with one of the other little girls. And she didn't know, she didn't catch the whole conversation. Um, But the, the other little girl was six and I was four. And she just heard me say, but how do you know what the Bible says is true? Oh, my word. <laughs> and at so, four and six at, years old. At, at four years old, yeah. So, um, you know, what What I I assume she'd walked into was me kind of questioning this, this six-year-old girl who was raised to be Christian, kind of noticing, well, if you say you believe something because the Bible says so, well, why do you believe the Bible, right? Um, and, you know, it sounds, um, it would be easy to look at that and sound like, say like, oh, you're, you're almost you know, raised with atheist propaganda or raised, you know, in that way. But I I think kids at that age, like we always ask why, um, right? And so saying, saying, but how do you know what the Bible says is true? is just a a way of saying, well, why do you believe in the Bible? And um, of course, the six-year-old girl didn't really have the best answer and I I wasn't compelled. And uh, what I found with a lot of Christians, even even now talking to them as adults, often they'll, they'll have kind of circular reasoning for why they believe in the Bible. Um, when it comes to like, well, I, I believe in the, the Bible because I think that, you know, God wrote it. And it's like, well, why do you believe in God? Well, it talks about him in the Bible. And you're like, well, that's, you know, that is a circular argument. Um, right. And so I think, it's very natural for kids, even at a young age, to start questioning. And uh, I think there's a, in the, the classical tradition, um, you know, seven is considered the, the age of reason. And uh, maybe having a philosophy professor as a father, you learn to reason a little bit younger. <laughs> yes, yes, so, I would imagine so. I, I can't imagine what your your dinner conversations must have been like. I'm, I'm sure he fostered that inquisitive nature in you. Um, obviously it was a very natural thing. If you're talking about it at a birthday party, you know, if you're asking questions, it, it, it was just part of who you were. I'm sure yeah. the way that you thought and, and that well, you, you were trained to thought, think logically. And, and my parents always, they very firmly, they always tried to answer when I asked the question, why, you know, and I think a lot of parents feel challenged by questions and, 
my parents just were never that that way and they always tried to encourage me in, in asking questions and I, I think that's sort of the, the funny thing I've discovered as I've gone through adult life and gone through a couple different types of jobs and I realized that's probably my greatest strength is uh asking the right questions um, yes and so I, I think that's something that you know uh, even though my my husband and I would raise our children differently with respect to what we believe um that that spirit of questioning is something that I still believe in very strongly and I think should be encouraged in children because the beautiful thing about Christianity is that if you dig deeply enough, you start to find answers. Um, and so, but, the, but that sort of first level questioning that happens as a child, sometimes um, you don't get good answers to that. So I remember the next, the next sort of thing I think about in my childhood when I think about um, my relationship with God, my great grandfather passed away when I was six years old. And, um, because they were, they were Catholic, you know, they had, um, a funeral mass. And I remember going to, um, to see him at, at the wake and there were prayer cards and, um, I, I cringe now. I, I kind of treated them like Pokemon cards. Like I wanted to collect them all. Um, and dad was like, you know, you can only get more cards like these if somebody passes away. Like you don't want that to happen. Right. Um, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but then afterwards, you know, the, the prayer cards did talk about did talk about God. And so um, it's funny. My parents never, you know, they never said don't pray or something like that. But uh, I remember after he passed away, I went home and um, I started praying to God and I, I kind of hid it because I, I again, like they never said, don't do this, but I, I kind of sensed that they wouldn't be behind it, you know? Right. And so, um, so I kind of secretly started praying to myself before I went to bed. And after about three weeks of praying, um, I kind of thought about it and I realized, you know, my, my grandfather had lived a long and, um, decent life and, uh, passed away. I, Oh, actually, you know, I was six. I don't even remember how old he was, but to me, he seemed ancient. Right. Uh, and his his body had started to deteriorate, and so I realized I was like, you know, I thought if we lived forever, we would just get older and older and more decrepit, and that wouldn't really be good either. So there is kind of a natural time where we need to pass. Like it's not it's not a bad thing. And um, when I realized that it sort of felt silly to ask God to stop that or to extend the life. Like it, it felt like, well, you should just accept that that's the natural way that things go. And in that sense, it's sort of the idea of God uh, kind of lost his power. You know, you don't really need him to overcome death per se. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's how I thought about it at six. And, um, and so that was kind of the last time until I until I really was seriously considering conversion that I had ever ever prayed um, after that after the I passing think, of my great grandfather. Yes, you know that that's an interesting example because it does I think demonstrate your intuitiveness, your wisdom, and your maturity really at age six to six to have that kind of conception to look at the logical outworking of <laughs> your prayer and what it would mean to live, you know, for a long time in this physical body. And that that's, that's quite, it shows how bright you were, I think at that time. That, in, in certain respects. Yeah. I think also it shows sort of a, a lack of imagination as well, that, that perhaps there could be some type of eternal life. Mm better than what we right. could ask for or imagine. So, you know, look, looking back, I can see, but I think that's sort of, you know, um, we all go through levels of questioning and um, a lot of people think that sort of questioning is the mature phase. And I think of questioning as like the, the sophomoric phase, um, you know, like you've progressed past your freshman level and now you're starting to question things but after you question you have to rebuild your own framework 
and right. decide what you believe. Because it's it's always easy to be tearing down other people's things. You know, um, at some point you have to to start constructing your own belief system. And so, um, I I did start doing that as I got older. And um, when I was thirteen, I remember um, well, twelve or thirteen. Uh, there was a big debate about whether the words under God should be taken out of the Pledge of Allegiance. And um, since I was an atheist, I said, yeah, I shouldn't be made to say under God. And so I stopped saying under God when we did the Pledge of Allegiance and things like that. Um, <laughs> and uh, I actually, there was kind of a, it ended up being in our school newspaper in middle school. There was a debate section and um, I didn't actually write the article. I had another kid write it and I edited it. But um, I ended up getting kind of into a, a, a fight of sorts with, uh, you know, an argument, not a physical fist fight or something right. um, with some of the, the boys in my class. And um, one of them actually threatened to come to my house and to uh, shoot all of the atheists. Um, oh, my. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah. definitely an example of uh Christian charity. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that's not an example of Christian love for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but so it was, it was, you know, sort of a curiosity in that sense, because a lot of the people around me had been raised going to church or at least believing in God. Um, and so there was some hostility there, um, you know, and, and of course, I think I told my teacher and they took care of it. And, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't an actual, um, you know, it's funny, I wonder, you know, 20 years later, if, if it would have been taken more seriously, him threatening something with a gun, um, than it was back then, but it, it was resolved reasonably well. Um, but that sort of galvanized me a bit. And in high school, I, I, uh, you know, I would get into some arguments with friends and I actually, at one point I, I brought a Bible to school with post-it notes in it where I had flagged the different contradictions. And I said, what do you make of this? You know? And, and of course, none of my friends, had particularly great answers because it, it wasn't something that they had really studied or devoted themselves to. Um, even if they were themselves religious or deeply religious. Uh, and so uh, as sort of, I went through high school, uh, being an atheist was a pretty significant part of my identity. And I was always open to debate. Um, in fact, some of them tried to debate me about creationism. And I even went and I, um, found a book written by a creationist and I, I read through the whole thing. I said, I'll, I'll debate you. I'll give you a fair shot as I think about this. Um, and at the end of the day, I read it and I just didn't find it academically compelling um, in terms of its arguments. And so uh, then I ended up um, leaving and, and going to Harvard. And it was only when I went to Harvard that I finally met somebody who could start answering some of the questions that I was asking. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you really were pushing back, you were, you were pushing back against Christianity, but also in a sense, were you justifying your own atheism in any regard? Were you, I know at, at a young age, you were thinking logically about logical conclusions of the outworking of your worldview through high school. I know because you were galvanized kind of against religion and for good reason, really, um, were you looking more closely at your own atheism in terms of its own grounding? Like you said a minute ago, where yeah. it's easy to kind of tear down, but it's harder to build up or, or formulate your own belief system. I, I imagine with your father being a philosophy professor, did you have these kind of discussions with him about um, what is atheism really? What what does it mean to be an atheist? What are the logical out? What are, you know the logical implications of this worldview uh, for yeah. different things? So we talked about it a little bit, and like I said, I would go to him with I would go with him to his classes where he would re review the different arguments for and against God and. Um, you know, I, he had always had a lot of books that I would uh, peek into and things like that. Um, for me, I think the central sort of philosophical question that I had was less about God per se, but more like what do you do 
what does it mean to be a good person? And what is morality? And that was the real sort of focus um, that I had in high school trying to figure that out. And I I was actually quite upset by it. Um, I remember um, I read some of Ayn Rand's work and um, I, I found a lot of her material appealing in the sense of I, I had a strong belief that there was an objective right and wrong. Um, but then I, I really felt that her philosophy didn't hold together particularly well. And I was, I was quite disturbed by this. And, um, you know, in, in school, we had to read things like uh, Camus and Sartre. And I remember distinctly that one of the things that one of the quotes was, um, one of the greatest philosophical questions is why not suicide? And uh, I felt like Rand didn't really give a good answer to that. And I even went to a talk that was put on by the Ayn Rand Institute, which is located in Irvine, of all places. And um, the guys just looked at me like I had two heads when I posed this question to them. <laughs> um, but I, I, it was really deeply troubling me. And, and so I was doing a lot of reading on it. And I ended up... Um, I ended up deciding to shelve the question. I said, uh, I realized it it was just consuming so much of my time. And I was like, I want to get into a good college and I want to, you know, hopefully get some scholarships. And so I'm going to bracket this question. Like, I I believe that there is such a thing as goodness. And I believe that there's something intrinsically beautiful about what it means to be human. Um, And it's funny because I I think I would have said that I believed those things. but I actually had a kind of mystical experience that convinced me of this. Um, and, but, it, but, but there was no sense of God in that experience, just of the sort of um, almost divine beauty in, in human beings. And so I said, I, I really firmly believe that, um, but I can't justify it now. I'll save it until college. Once I get into college, then I'll devote myself more, more firmly to pursuing the question. And so I think that's part of the reason why when somebody started arguing with me about morality and, and God and things like that, I was open to it because, you know, I had said, okay, I'm going to bracket this so I can get into a good college and then I'll, I'll think about it. And the strategy ultimately worked because <laughs> I got into Harvard. Right. Um, and, and so I think in that sense, I was open to it. But for me, the morality, why, what is, what is good and why should we be good those were the the things that i really was wrestling with um because i believed it to be true i just couldn't account for why Mm. and so that was actually the first point that the the person um joseph porter that i was arguing with uh who who was a, a fellow student with me um that was the point that he started pressing me on he said you you believe very strongly in being good but what does being good even mean to you um and and if there's no god how do you have a sense of objective morality Mm. um yeah it's so funny as i go through it also there's so many other points that i i think about like i i actually had a teacher in high school who i kind of had been discussing some of this stuff with and the teacher wouldn't tell me his own beliefs but he kind of said, you've got two systems, you know, you either believe that there's an objective morality and that it's given by God, or you think that morality exists because, um, you know, there's some type of human consensus on it. And he said, if you, if you want to talk to somebody who believes in it because of the human consensus, go talk to this other teacher. And, and I was close to the other teacher um, as well, because I was in Amnesty International, a, a club that he ran. And so I was very close to him. And I said, I don't believe that. How could something be objective if it's just what this group of people agrees on? What if the people change their minds? What if, you know, so that was unappealing to me. Um, But I also didn't want to say that objective morality only existed because of God. And so I kind of was stuck. And he said, here's this dilemma. And I was like, oh, I'm I'm really stuck. I don't, I can't accept either either horn of it. And um, later I ended up following up with that teacher. He kind of, you know, he had to be careful as we had conversations because he, you know, as a public school teacher, you're not really supposed to proselytize your students. 
Sure. Um, and so I think he, he walked a, fi a fine line. But now we're actually good friends and, and we still stay in touch. Um, and so he was helpful to me in that way, sort of framing the problem that way. Um, and so then I kind of had to, to go and figure out, okay, what is the objective grounding for this? But as I studied more philosophy, I just couldn't, I couldn't find a way to ground an objective morality. We'll return to our story in just a moment, but first I'd like to ask you a few questions. Have you ever wondered what heaven is really going to be like? What we will look like? What we will do? We all have questions about what heaven will look like. And after 25 years of extensive research, Dr. Randy Alcorn has the answers. On January 22nd, 2021, the C.S. Lewis Institute will have a live stream event with Dr. Randy Alcorn and Randy will be teaching about heaven. You can find out more about this live stream event and register on the C.S. Lewis website, www.cslewisinstitute.org. If for some reason you missed this episode, you can always find it in our resources area. Now let's get back to our conversation. Jordan, for, uh, before we move on with this, this mm -hmm. fabulous story, for those people listening who might be um, just curious or, or maybe pushing back against the idea that thinking atheists can be good without God, or I can mm. be good with, I can know what's good and bad without God. I don't need yeah. God. Can you clarify mm -hmm. what that complaint might be against what you're talking about, which is perhaps not knowledge, but grounding for yeah. good, good and evil or, or objective morality, really? Christians also often answer this question quite badly. So I talk to a lot of Christians and what they would say is, well, you know, I, I try to do good things because I want to go to heaven. Well, if you only do good things because you want to go to, to heaven, uh, that's not really good, <laughs> you know? That's, yes. I mean, it's not, it's, not, it's not terrible, but your motivation is selfish, right? Um, and the person who does good just because they think it's what they ought to do ostensibly is better than the, the person who does it because they think that they're going to gain some benefit out of it. Um, and so I like in theology, there's the concept of um, perfect contrition or imperfect contrition. Um, you know, a, a person who regrets something that they've done only because they're afraid of the effects, um, you know, is not. It, that's a that's an imperfect contrition, you know. Mm -hmm. You you want to you want to have regret um, for the action of itself for for the failure, not because you're afraid of the consequences. And in the same right. way, when you think about the, the heaven, you know, you want to um, you want to be doing good because you value the good as good as goodness itself, not just because you want a good outcome. And, and I think that's true, um, you know, in that sense, that's true, whether you're an, an atheist or a Christian, that it's important that you're pursuing the good, not just because you want to gain from it. Um, and so. So, yeah, so it's, it's hard to know exactly what is good, how to ground who determines what's good? What is good? Like you were saying, is it is it just social consensus? Is it anything more than that? Is it just um, is it just for survival of ourselves and our family? You know, this whole concept of goodness ha is there's it's wrapped up in a lot of different deep questions, and it sounds like though you're a deep questioner, and but you were being challenged on these issues at Harvard. Um, who was doing this challenging? Was it a, a Christian who was actually informed with regard to these deeper philosophical issues? Yeah. So basically, um, you know, it was a, a friend of a friend and it had started, we had started um, discussing politics and that quickly uh, transformed into talking about morality. Um, and so it was a, a Christian, uh, Joseph Porter, who had studied more philosophy and, um, he he was also a philosophy major. I actually originally hadn't studied philosophy, um, and I, I switched majors after I became a, a, a Christian. But um, he basically just started 
pressing me on some of these things. Like, okay, you say that you believe in goodness, but how do you define it? Where does it come from? And as he questioned me, I realized, like I said, uh, it's easy to ask the questions, but it's hard to build up a framework. And, um, and so I, I, you know, tried to mount some defenses, but ultimately I realized that his questions were good questions, and I, I struggled to construct a view in which we really were, you know, you think about what it means to be human from an atheist perspective. Well, it just happens that, you know, the universe came into existence, maybe just because it's one of many different universes, and human beings just happened to evolve, and now we're collections of molecules and atoms that travel throughout this, you know, little dot in space that circles around a sun, right? In in some sense, uh, if that's just the account of what it means to be human, then it's quite hard to articulate why we should strive to be good. Um, you know, it just it just means that it's a different set of atoms colliding with another set of atoms. And as an atheist, I found it very hard to to sort of construct any type of goodness or, or argument for why we should try to be good that was, you know, well grounded. And so he really, you know, he really pushed me on that point. And um, then he also pushed me on um, other points about, about God. And so um, he, he pushed me on, you know, how did the universe come into existence? And, um, you know, there are certain, there are certain qualities about our universe. So, um, my understanding, and, and I'm not a physicist, so I'm not far from an expert on this. My understanding is that there are certain, um, laws of nature, which, uh, have particular properties. And, um, if the laws of nature were tweaked even just a little bit, um, you know, the universe would not be able to exist and human beings would never come into being. And so, uh, you know, you sort of have to give an account for, well, how do you think that the universe came into existence? And how do you think that something could come from nothing? And there are other responses. Uh, you know, some atheists believe in the multiverse, that there are many different universes and ours just happens to be the one that we came to evolve into. Um, but then you still have to ask, well, where did the multiverse come from? And um, basically, we started arguing about the cosmological argument, this concept of there are all of these contingent things. You know, I exist because my parents existed and their parents existed and they exist because at some point, you know, an amoeba <laughs> uh, evolved into something greater. And that happened because, you know, you can draw this line back and back and back, but all of those things are contingent. And it seems like you need something that's not contingent to start at all. And um, and after sort of mulling this over for a while, I found this argument, you know, compelling. Um, the the thing is, you know, I said, okay, um, I'll admit there's this type of necessary rather than contingent being that must have been the start of the universe. The way that I um, have heard it framed as well as you imagine you've got a building, right? And, and each floor rests on the previous floor, but at a certain point for the building to stand, there has to be a foundation, right? It has to be a, a story that's not like the other stories. Uh, and so it's okay, sure. I believe in this foundation. I believe in this necessary being. And he's like, well, if you believe in that, you believe in God. I'm like, hold up. <laughs> There's a lot of other things Christians <laughs> talk about when they talk about God. I'm like, okay, fine. If you want to call that God, you can call that God. Fine. So I, I stopped being an atheist and I started being a deist. And I had the most minimal view of God that you could possibly have. Hmm. Um, Just a first cause, basically. Basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, And so from there, then we started arguing about, okay, are miracles possible? And... Um, he said, of course, miracles aren't possible. You know, there are these laws and all the things. It's like, well, if you admit that there's this entity, you know, we, we haven't even agreed that the entity has 
intelligence or persona, right? But if you agree that there's this entity that's somehow responsible for the starting of this whole thing, well, why couldn't that entity, um, why couldn't the entity affect the laws, right? If, if the entity is the one that created the laws, why do they have to hold in all places and at all times? And I realized that, you know, one of the features of science is that we, we look at the world and we extrapolate and we measure things like, you know, we, we go and we measure gravity, right? And we say gravity is part of the laws of nature. Um, but that's, that's just an observation, right? And in, in fact, the funny thing is, if we observe exceptions, we assume that we've made the mistake, right? Um, so I, I think about in, in my physics class, uh, we attempted to measure gravity. And of course, we didn't quite get to 9.8, um, right? We, we ended up getting like 9.6 or uh, 10 point something. And our physics teacher is like, you guys just, you know, your timers aren't very precise and your hands were off, right? And, but it's funny because <laughs> in one sense, when he sees an observation that doesn't match with the law, he says that the observation is flawed. Now, that makes sense in this particular case for gravity and, and you know, he's correct that our instruments aren't good and we probably weren't as precise as we could be. He, he wasn't wrong in that case. but it sort of shifts the way that you think about the laws if you start to recognize that the laws are extrapolations. We assume that they're holding in all places. Um, and there are parts of physics that it does become problematic. So one area that physics still struggles to account for, and my understanding, again, I'm not a physicist, but there's um, debate about what happens at the center of a black hole because we have two different models for what happens in physics. We have things that are modeled when they're very small with quantum mechanics, and we have things modeled when they're very large, um, you know, with the theory of relativity and gravity and all of these things. But we can't quite figure out in the center of a black hole where both should start to hold. We don't know what that looks like. And the laws may be very different there. Um, and so you started to think about that. It was like, well, if there was a miracle, that's sort of the funny thing about it. You, you would kind of, you would, in one sense, you would view it as an exception to the laws of nature, or you would assume that it was mistaken. What I started to realize is if you're assuming that it's mistaken, you're sort of, you're taking your philosophy, your, your secular philosophy, that there is no such thing as a miracle. And you're applying it to the observation. Anytime you observe a miracle, you're going to disbelieve that miracle. And so um, after we kind of debated the philosophy of it, I realized, okay, I can admit that, that if there's this entity that created the, the universe, then it's possible that miracles could occur, theoretically. Um, and so from there, then you have to start arguing about any individual miracle. And I will say that I'm still a skeptic. Uh, there are a lot of people that will claim miraculous things. Um, and there are a lot of circumstances that emerge in, in our lives and that I've seen emerge in my life since becoming a Christian uh, that, you know, seem ordinarily miraculous. Maybe that's a funny term to say, but, but you know, the sort of things that uh, could happen by circumstance without God's existence, but that Christians might attribute to God, you know, mm -hmm. the, um, I, I said a prayer and, um, you know, that my uh, child would be healed and, and they got better, right? Um, you could think, well, there's there's some natural explanation. We just don't know what it is yet, right? You, you could sort of look at it that way. Um, and, and I think that there are a lot of cases like that where we should be rightfully skeptical of people that claim miracles have occurred. Um, but uh, then, you know, we started looking at some of the, the heavier duty miracles. And in particular, the miracle that we started arguing about was Jesus's resurrection. Um, and is that, did that miracle actually happen? Um, and we also had been arguing about the Bible in general. Um, is it, is it reliable? And there were a couple of things that really, um, shifted my perspective on, on the reliability of the Bible. So, um, one of the things, I think one of the common misconceptions about the Bible is that sort of there's this game of telephone that was played. 
and um, you know it's it's you know there's just been so many manuscripts and copyists who could introduce errors. And one of the the interesting things that I studied further was um, you know when they that was like something commonly said about the Bible and. For a long time, the oldest manuscript that we had uh, was dated to about 950 AD. And um, when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, they uh, actually got copies of scripture that were dating back to, uh, you know, around 200 BC. And they found that in that 1100 year period, um, the number of changes was pretty minor. Um, so the, uh, I'm thinking there's one, one chapter of Isaiah where there were, I want to say 10 differences and a bunch of them were spelling. Um, and there was the, basically the only real difference was the addition of one word light, which didn't change the meaning of the passage in any way. Um, and so, what I realized is that although there are these minor discrepancies like spelling or typos or things like that that can be found in these manuscripts, um, the overall message has been remarkably consistent. And um, for me as a philosopher, the uh, there's this concept in philosophy um, of, of a proposition. So you can make a statement, right? Like the sky is blue. And you could make uh, the statement in French. Um, uh, oh, gosh. Now I'm blanking because my French isn't very good. I forget if it's le or la. Uh, but le ciel uh, est bleu would be the French. And the two sentences, the two statements are different, right? The word blue or the word is is different in both languages. But the proposition that they represent is the same because they're both conveying the same piece of information about reality. They're just doing it in different languages. And so I realized what was sort of remarkable to me is that the central proposition of scripture had remained remarkably consistent, even if, as you go through, um, there are these subtle changes in the manuscripts that, you know, slight, uh, slight typos and things like that. And for me, that made it feel um, more more human, but no less, well, I guess I didn't think it was divine to begin with, but, but in one sense, it actually felt uh, like it had been well-preserved, kind of well-preserved more than any other document um, in such a way that, that made me able to see God's hand in the process. And I think it's funny because you can look at it and you can see, okay, this has been transmitted with like 99% accuracy. And um, you could be astonished that it's been transmitted so well, 99%. That's like, you know, A plus territory. Um, and you can look at it and be so disappointed about the 1%. Um, there's, there was an interesting um, example in, in biblical studies. Um, one of the most famous scholars today is Bart Ehrman, who's a skeptic. And he trained under Bruce Metzger who was a believer. And um, Metzger looked at it, and he looked at the 90% and thought it was very impressive. And um, Ehrman had been raised in an evangelical community where he believed that every jot and tittle in scripture um, had to be consistent. And so for him, the 1% was astonishing and intolerable. And as a result, after he finished his studies, or through the process of doing his studies, he stopped believing in God. And now he's the, the probably the most notable secular biblical scholar in the United States. Um, but really, for me, I, I took Metzger's position because I had grown up thinking, look, there are all these contradictions, there are all these problems in it. And seeing that it had been transmitted accurately was, was quite astonishing to me. Um, it, and so you know, it almost feels like part of what happened was how we were raised to believe in scripture shaped how we interpreted this reality about how well it had been transmitted. Mm. Um, I also went through and was looking up the contradictions in scripture and uh, I came to view some of them as um, 
uh, making it more believable. So mm, there's one example of how um, Judas died. And so in one part of scripture, it says um, he uh, hung himself. Um, And in the other part, uh, it says he fell and his guts spilled out, more or less. And, uh, you know, some people will say, well, maybe he hung himself and then fell down and his guts spilled out or something like that. And there's a way that you can do that. But for me, the fact that there are different accounts, you know, because they come from different people, it started to make it seem more believable. Um, In the same way that if you had two eyewitnesses testifying in a court, and if they agreed on every detail, you'd start to become a little suspicious. You know, you'd start to be thinking, well, maybe they sat down beforehand to get their story together, because otherwise, like, how do they have every single thing? How could they possibly remember it the exact same? And in the same way with scripture, I think the fact that it's written by different people and there are these minor differences between them, that to me makes it more compelling. Because essentially the the central proposition, these claims about who Jesus was, these are the same and consistent. Um, And those minor details that don't matter, they add, in my mind, to the reliability of the witness um, without detracting from the overall inspiration of the central proposition, um, which is about God's relationship to mankind. We're going to quickly pause our story for a moment so that I can tell you a little bit about the C.S. Lewis Institute. For over 40 years, the Institute has been committed to developing wholehearted disciples of Jesus Christ who will articulate, share, defend, and live their faith in personal and public life. Please consider making a donation to the C.S. Lewis Institute. To donate, go to our website at www.cslewisinstitute.org and click Donate. Thank you. Now let's get back to our story. You've, you, you obviously went through a very intentional, thoughtful process as you were going through all of these issues, beginning with the moral argument, you know, what is goodness, where does that come from, moving towards, you know, how did the universe get here, why is there something rather than nothing, looking more, you know, from a philosophical perspective, and then you were, and scientific, and you were looking at how scientific philosophy, methodological naturalism informs really the method uh, that that excludes the possibility of God, really. And you were realizing these things. And so I think it's almost like you're, you're going down a little bit of a breadcrumb trail and you're picking up one or opening one door and you're looking in there and seeing, now how does that make sense? And then very thoughtfully pursuing all of these different steps, the Bible, Jesus' resurrection, and it's moving you further along the way, even though you were still somewhat skeptic, you weren't so closed off that you were open towards seeing where the evidence leads you. And it was leading you along this road, albeit reluctantly, it seems like at times. <laughs> yeah. Um but nevertheless, you had, because you were very intellectual and a questioner and you had to be true to yourself, you couldn't ignore what you were finding or discovering or realizing in a sense. So almost yeah. <laughs> against your own, it, it was like driven by your nature, but almost against your own nature. You know, you were moving along this this road. Um, I wondered if you knew, if you could tell where this was taking you. Yeah, you know, I, I definitely could. And I, I saw this transitioning, this transition happening in myself. Um, I think for me, what was significant and what, what was helpful in going through the process, like you said, you're sort of picking up these breadcrumbs one by one. I think a lot of people, when they have doubts, they can feel really overwhelming. You know, if I had sat down at the beginning and I had said, well, I don't believe all of these things about Christianity, um, it would be like, well, I, I'll never, I'll never become convinced, right? Um, 
But if you sort of isolate the questions one by one and, and analyze them separately, you know, in some sense, there, there are dependencies there. Asking, is the miracle of the resurrection possible, um, depends on whether miracles are possible in general. But it, it's important that you sort of break down what each question is and take them one by one, because otherwise it's, it's too overwhelming and you're going to have foggy thinking. Um, and so instead, if you can split out what your questions are, that allows you to pursue them deeply enough to, to the point where you can feel more confident in the answers that you find. And so that was sort of what ha happened to me slowly over time. As I started going through this process, um, once, once I became a deist, um, which was probably about halfway through, I uh, started going to church as well, uh, mostly just to find out more. Um, and it was something I hadn't really, you know, I had occasionally gone to, to Catholic mass with my grandmother and um, things like that. But uh, it was the first time I'd ever, you know, really gone on my own with an eye toward understanding and, and learning, you know, not that I agreed with everything, but just to kind of see what this whole thing's about. Um, and so I started going through that process. And I also started doing a Bible study with some women. and. Um, at the same time that I was having the, the sort of philosophical questions with my friend Joseph, I was having some some personal questioning with uh, these women as well. Um, for me, you know, like I said, I had always viewed myself primarily as a good person. And um, you can hear my newborn is starting to wake up. If there's anything mm -hmm. that makes you think you're a good person, once you have children, you realize how wrong you were. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, any parent will appreciate that. Yeah, and and connect with that for sure. <laughs> yeah, um, but but basically, as I started talking with these women, I started realizing that you know Christianity had a higher standard than I had been uh, made to believe, and I I read through the Sermon on the Mount, and I realized you know Jesus has a very high standard. He says not not just that you can't murder people, but you can't even be angry. And it's, it's not, you know, enough to not commit adultery, but you, you can't even lust after people because that's adultery in your heart. And when I started realizing that, I realized that deep down um, there was a lot of, of anger in me and um, there was a lot of, uh, I think every family has their sins, um, but I think in particular I've noticed that um, in my family, uh, we can, we can hold a grudge, you know, and, um, realizing that I wasn't a very forgiving person, uh, you know, I, I started realizing, yeah, if, if this is the, the standard that God has for goodness, then by any stretch, I'm, I'm not good. Um, and shifting from thinking, um, that, you know, like roughly we're all good, we're all good people, like, you know, most people will probably get to heaven if it's for good people because, you know, we're not like going out and again, like we're not murdering people or most people aren't, aren't getting into fights and things like that. Shifting from that perspective to the perspective of all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God um, was, was pretty dramatic and, and realizing, you know, I'm not as good as I like to think myself. Um, developing a sense of that humility was, was significant for me. So as someone who has really walked both sides and, and you, you took a very judicious journey, journeying from atheism to Christianity and even a judicious journeying even into your and through your Christianity, which I so appreciate, um, what would you say to perhaps someone who might be listening, who's curious, who's, a, who's an atheist, maybe an agnostic or for someone who really hasn't considered God or Christianity very thoughtfully, um, but perhaps might be open to it, what would you say to someone like that? Yeah, I think that, first of all, it's great that you have that openness. And I would say continue to be open to God, um, whoever you meet, wherever you end up. Um, I think the first step, like I said, Read through the New Testament yourself. Encounter Jesus in the Gospels. And then try to live out these teachings that you see there. You know, 
I think a great place to start is always the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and then the other thing I would say from my own experience was you have to live out the truth. Um, and, and you have to take the steps of commitment that that entails. So getting baptized, um, if you've already been baptized, getting confirmed, if, um, if you've already done those things, you know, getting back involved in a church community. And I would also say, be conscientious as you enter a church community. Um, I think one of the things I struggled the most with as a new believer was finding a good church community. Um, and I, I went through several churches that uh, had their varying problems. And uh, <laughs> a quote that always sticks with me is, if the church were perfect, then I'd have no place in it. Um, because <laughs> I'm not perfect, right? I mean, uh, none of us but, are. Right? Yeah, but, you know, try to find a, a community that's that's strong and healthy. It seems to be living out these teachings as best you understand them. Um, and, you know, don't, you know, don't, uh, don't let others spiritually, uh, steamroll you, you know, ask questions and, um, and try to find a place that seems like they're doing their best to follow the teachings. You know, there are a lot of churches today that reject certain parts of, of scripture whether that's rejecting the parts about sexual morality or whether that's rejecting the parts that um, are talking about caring for the poor um, or whether that's just the parts that talk about idolatry and, and God's kingdom coming first. You know, in, in America, we have a common heresy of thinking that America is the end all be all. And there are a lot of churches where of voting for Trump is more important than living out your faith and in, in other ways. And so, you know, knowing that a vote is not, a vote does not a Christian make. There are many other things that, that are involved. So finding a place that seems to be uh, very holistic in their approach to, um, to, to Christianity, I think is important. That's good advice. And to those uh, who are Christians who might be listening to this podcast and want to be able to engage meaningfully with those who don't believe, but may be apprehensive or perhaps may, may need some encouragement or even counsel as to the way that they embody Christianity, uh, what would you say to, to Christians who might be listening? Yeah, I think um, a couple of things. One is that fear can sometimes um, it it can sometimes be a good thing. Sometimes you're afraid because you actually don't know enough, and so if you're afraid because you know you don't know what you would say or um, you feel like you just don't understand things well enough, then go study the faith. You know, uh, Saint Peter advises that you need to have an answer to the questions that people are asking you. Um, well, if you haven't studied it yourself, how would you have an answer? So go and study these things um, and, and see, is that the source of your fear? Or is the fear coming from some other place of timidity, uh, of, of a spirit that's a, a, you know, afraid to stand for what you believe in, in which case it's really a lack of courage. Um, and if it's a lack of courage, you know, take heart and practice and start small. I think a lot of people are afraid that... You know, there are certain people that get into the habit of um, debating to win rather than debating to find truth. And if you are that type of person, it, it can be helpful to rather than um, think of it as a debate, just, you know, try to ask good questions. And, and that's what I saw Joseph do with me. You know, ask, well, what does good mean to you? And how can objective morality exist if you don't have a God? To ground it in, you know, in, in one sense, uh, you could you could think about argue, asking that in an argumentative way. How could you believe in a God, or how how could you believe in the good without God, right? Uh, but there's a, a friendly way to ask it, and so 
you know, what I found is in general, if you talk to people about, the, about their religious beliefs and you ask questions in an open-ended and non-accusatory way, very few people react badly. Um, and so think about and practice ways to ask those questions sort of less confrontationally. Um, because I think when you do that, then you have nothing to fear. You're just asking people about their deeply held beliefs. And most people are glad to explore those. Um, and finally, uh, I would say, please, please do not argue with people about creationism. Um, <laughs> that, that's the one thing that I look back and I just think, you know, I had multiple Christian friends in high school who wanted to talk about creationism. And that did not resonate with me. I still don't believe in, um, you know, young earth or old earth creationism. I believe in a God that guided evolution. And most of the denominations in the United States believe that explicitly in their mission statements, that you can believe in evolution. And so I just look back and I think, what a shame, these Christians who are very, you know, very fervent and um, faithful believers, but they spent their time arguing with me about something that was never going to, it, it never ended, right? Like it, it's, I still believe what I believed from the beginning, um, you know, with the exception that I believe God guided the process now rather than believing it was purely naturalistic. But in that, all that time, they never stopped to talk to me about who Jesus was, what he taught, why he taught it. Um, it, it really, it's mind boggling to me that I grew up in the United States in Orange County, which is, you know, moderate in general. Like there are a lot of liberals there. There are a lot of conservatives there. And I had never heard the gospel until I was 18 and in college because every time I had ended up talking to people and, and what I found in Orange County when I've gone back is that um, you will meet Christians there who will be sleeping with their boyfriend, getting drunk every weekend, and they all think that they're a good Christian because they believe in creationism. And th that's really that's really missing the <laughs> the the picture. And and you've got bigger fish to fry than that. So I I you know I don't judge people that are creationists. Um, I have a lot of respect for, for various ones. And if that's what you believe, by all means, you're free to go ahead and believe it. And, and I still welcome you as a brother or sister in Christ. Um, but I just ask that you not make that the central thing that you argue with atheists about, because it, it's, it's very rare that it will work. And, um, if it does, and somebody later comes to, to change their mind and not believe in evolution or to not believe in creationism, creationism anymore, then you've undermined the central part of their faith. And I think that's also really not fair. The faith needs to be grounded on the rock that is Jesus um, mm. and, and not on some other philosophy or some other belief system. So I'm so glad that you brought this, Jordan, to the center, which is Jesus and his question, who do you say that I am? Because as you as you say, we we so many we oftentimes get distracted, whether we're atheists or Christians or whatever, about secondary or really non-essential issues and, yeah. and end up going down rabbit trails. And instead of really looking at keeping the main thing, the main thing, you know, mere Christianity, who is Jesus? Was he resurrected? Uh, you know, was he the son of God? He claimed to be, you know, those big, big questions um, regarding truth, because he claimed to be truth, not just that he... He, he knows truth or that he tells truth that he is the truth. So thank you for bringing that back around front and central. Yeah. And also, Jordan, I really appreciate your story. It, it's, I love it because it's just so incredibly thoughtful. <laughs> and, for the, and for those who you know, think that anyone, those who think that Christians aren't thinking people or intellectual people, I mean, you're Ivy League educated. You really moved this through this process from one strong ideology to another. 
in a very careful, diligent way. And no one can fault you for that. And I, and I just appreciate the way in which you did it, the, the intellectual integrity in which you, you did it, as well as, like you say, this is adopting another worldview is more than just a, an intellectual journeying. You, you really looked at it in terms of where these ideas lead. They mean something. You, they are embodied sensibility of um, truth. So thank you for the, the really full and holistic way in which you, you told us about your journey in the way that you live as a Christian now. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, and uh, thank you for giving me extra time. I will say, you can ask my family, I have never been accused of uh, underthinking things. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, that's really wonderful. Well, thank you again, Jordan. Thanks for tuning into the Side B Podcast to hear Jordan's story. For questions and feedback about this episode, you can reach me by email at the Side B Podcast at cslewisinstitute.org. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and share this podcast with your friends and social network. In the meantime, I'll be looking forward to seeing you next time where we'll be listening to the other side.